In a small region along the Chinese-Indian border, there runs a chance for confrontation to turn into a full-blown crisis. And this is between two nuclear-armed nations, namely China and India. The mode of contention, the Sikkim sector, over which China and India's ally Bhutan is locked in a territorial dispute. In this edition of the debate, we'll discuss this crisis and why this problem is showing its ugly head at this point in time. The border standoff between India and China has been ongoing since mid-June, when Indian troops halted a high mountain road construction project by Chinese troops on the disputed Doklam Plateau in the Tibet region. China's foreign minister has, in his first remarks on the spot, blamed India for triggering the ongoing military standoff near the Sikkim border. Wang Yi has ruled out any talks on the issue with New Delhi unless Indian troops conscientiously withdraw from the Doklam border region claimed by both Bhutan and China. The Chinese premier argues that no constructive talks can be held as long as Indian troops are on the Chinese side of the frontier. Wang also noted that India has in the past admitted that its troops entered the territory that's under Chinese control. On Monday, the Chinese Defense Ministry in similar comments demanded that Indian troops pull back from the Doklam Plateau. We strongly urge India to take solid measures to correct its mistakes, desist from provocation and go toward the same direction with China so as to maintain peace and tranquility in the border areas. The foreign ministry spokesman has urged India not to test China's resolve and called on Indian troops to end provocations in the tri-junction between India, China and Bhutan. India has also been warned that Chinese troops will strongly and firmly safeguard the country's sovereignty and security interests. China and India have each deployed 3,000 troops to the tri-junction following the dispute, which has raised concerns about an all-out war. In response to the situation, Chinese border troops have taken emergency response measures in the area and are expected to step up deployment and training. New Delhi argues that China's road construction in Doklam will represent a significant change of the status quo for India. Well, I would say China has been the aggressor here because China knows that any kind of road construction in the border area always makes uh, India uh, very nervous because the only reason to, uh, they're certainly not going to do any development there. Those roads there are for the quick uh, faster deployment of military forces, particularly heavy weapons, along the border. India has called for both sides to withdraw their troops from the region and has spoken of engaging in quiet diplomacy to end the standoff. Many now fear that after a month of border tensions, Beijing's heightened rhetoric and failure to resolve the border spat in due time could lead to a repeat of the 1962 bloody war between the two countries. Our well, guest joining us for this edition of the debate, former U.S. Senate Foreign Policy Analyst James Atras joins us from Washington. And we have Indian journalist and political commentator uh, Shoban Saxena, who joins us from Sao Paulo. I'd like to welcome you both. Let me uh, start with you, uh, Shoban Saxena, if I may. And uh, perhaps this uh, dispute, it's a good time to hear your version of a brief history check as to why this crisis has occurred now and what is behind it. I think we need to step back uh, into history uh, a little back to understand the situation. Uh, when India got independence in 1947 and China had the revolution in 1949, there was no dispute between India and China on the border issue. Uh, the problem started when China made a claim to Tibet, uh, which, it, which was at the time an independent country. And in 1959, when Chinese troops actually moved into Tibet and occupied it, uh, and the problem became very big and it led actually to a war between India and China in 1962. You have to remember that historically, of course, India and China are neighbors, but we never had a border with each other. India's border was actually always was with Tibet and we still call it Indo-Tibetan border. Uh, after occupying China, Tibet, I think Chinese forces, Chinese governments have made claims to other parts of the region, parts of India in Jammu and Kashmir, parts of Bhutan and uh, and the whole whole boundary is disputed. And this has been going on since 1962. There was a war, and after that, in 1970s and 80s, there have been again and again, there have been many issues with both the countries claiming that territory belongs to them. And I think suddenly now it has exploded uh, into a big crisis. The real worrying 
sign here is the kind of language being used by China, by Beijing, giving India warnings, asking them to withdraw the forces, despite the fact that this is not Chinese territory, it's part of Bhutan, it's on the Tibetan border, which is all disputed. Well, uh, James Atras, uh, it would help to f uh, actually have clarification as to who is the gr aggressor here. Do you think that China is the aggressor, or has it been India? Uh, at least uh, because this is somewhat a relatively new thing for many people and many viewers uh, regarding the uh, latest crisis, how do you see each of the countries in terms of how they have dealt with it? Well, first, I, I think my colleague for that uh, historical roundup, I think it's very helpful to the viewers to see that all these, these kinds of disputes always have a buildup, a long context in which we, we need to place them mentally. Uh, I, I have to say your question is rather an American one. Americans always want to know who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, who's got the white hat, who's got the black hat. And it seems to me when we have the two most populous countries in the world, both of which with nuclear weapons, the real question is not who's right and who started it, but rather how do we stop it. Uh, I can understand that from the Chinese point of view, they say this is sovereign Chinese territory and we can build any kind of road we want to. I can understand from the Indian side that, that they're saying, no, this is not Chinese territory, this is Bhutan's territory, uh, and that, that these troops are not inside China's territory. Again, the Chinese can say, we're building a road, it's on our territory, we, can, we don't need a justification, whereas India can say, look, this, this is very close to the so-called chicken's neck, this is a very strategic area, for, for India getting to its uh, northeastern states like Assam and Nagaland. This is a, a, a pattern of Chinese aggression. I don't think these charges and counter charges are in anyone's interest, certainly of neither China nor India, and I hope that maybe some third country can, can find some way to, to um, mediate this, this, uh, this dispute and come to some peaceful step down by both sides. Well, Mr. Uh, Saxon, you talked about some uh, warnings that have come from both sides. Let's uh, discuss uh, some of them, and I'm going to quote what uh, China, for example, has said. India, for it to pull back its troops in the border dispute, has said, uh, t it told India not to push your luck and uh, pull back troops. And also, shaking a mountain is easy, but shaking the People's Liberation Army is hard. India uh, saying that the India of 2017 is different from the India of 1962. Uh, how, how do you see these reactions coming from both sides? Because they are rather severe in uh, their tone. Yeah, I, I, I'll again go back uh, to history, to 1962, when a war happened between India and China. It was a short war, uh, almost three weeks, uh, maximum a month. But I think that war, one of the reasons it happened was uh, domestic policy, domestic politics in China. Uh, there was a lot of upheaval happening in China at the time. Mao Zedong was trying to get control of the party, of the control of the People's Liberation Army. And uh, I think it was also uh, to teach a lesson, a lesson to India being a, a democratic country. Uh, India was trying to develop a different kind of model. I think that all led to uh, a war between India and China. It was not just a border dispute. And I think at the same uh, at today, if you look at, uh, if you look at China, uh, what's happening inside China? Uh, Xi Jinping is trying to get to, you know, he's trying to become more and more powerful. He's trying to become a, a very strong world leader. Uh, and that's why I think the, the, the kind of language being used, especially by China, is really very, very worrying. They're saying, they're telling India very, very, in a very clear terms that if you don't withdraw, there could be a war. Uh, you know, as, as my colleague just said, India and China are two very big countries with nuclear weapons and talk of war, even hint of a war. I think is a very irresponsible position for any country to take. Well, uh, James Atras, uh, uh, don't you think that it's kind of odd that you have these two uh, rather large countries that are well known in terms of their size, in terms of their uh, uh, just their, their whole, uh, I guess, uh, image that they have, to be able to perhaps behind the scenes work this out and not have this come out on the public domain as it is unfolding? Uh, because when it comes out like this, it gives a hint that perhaps they couldn't work uh, their differences out over the matter. 
Uh, one would think so. One would hope so. But evidently that hasn't happened. And, and I agree with my colleague. This kind of rhetoric, whether it's from China or from India, is, is t totally unhelpful. I think we need to put this in a somewhat broader international context as well. As we know, earlier this year, both India and Pakistan became full members of the, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, that India, uh, which for many years uh, has been a very close friend of Moscow, also had been able to improve its relationship with China, at least to some extent. I, I do wonder, though, whether Prime Minister Modi is shifting that strategic picture back to, uh, let's say, more reliance on the United States, more orientation toward the West. I, I should say that about a decade ago, I worked as a part of a team of lobbyists for the government of India in uh, getting Congress to approve the civil nuclear cooperation with India. And I recall there were many people here in the United States who, who weren't interested in India as such. They wanted India as a counterweight to China. They saw it as a, as a weapon against China. And uh, at that time, I recall the Indian government was quite clear. We're nobody's tool. That India will stand up for its own interests, but India is not interested in being used as a cat's paw for the Americans or for anybody else. They're, they're, they're focused on their own national interest and a very strong defense of the principle of sovereignty. And I, and I hope that is what is guiding New Delhi in its approach to this and that somehow they're not maybe mistaking uh, what the, the nature of the strategic environment is. What do you think, uh, Mr. Saxon, do you think that uh, India perhaps uh, is siding with Washington or is under the sphere of Washington. I mean, we know that there's a, well, Beijing seems to think there's a camaraderie between Washington and New Delhi uh, under the U.S. President Donald Trump, who met with the Indian Prime Minister recently. I think one of the things that we Indians are very proud of uh, since independence in 1947, and that is our independent foreign policy. Uh, during the Cold War, when the world was a much more dangerous place, India followed a very independent foreign policy. India was one of the top leaders of the non-line movement. And uh, we refused to side with, with on either the side of the East or West. I think and uh, despite the changes in the, in the geopolitics in the global situation at the moment, I think India continues to follow independent foreign policy. I think Beijing would like the world to believe or would like uh, uh, their people to believe that India is siding with U.S., India is making some kind of alliance with the U.S. against China, and the West China has to be more stronger, uh, more have to use a threatening voice, a threatening language against India. But I don't think, of course, India has uh, honestly get a bit closer to U.S. Strategic, strategically, but now India believes in the policy of multi-alignment. India has very strong relations with Russia. India also has very, very growing relations with China. I mean, India and China are part of many multilateral groups like the BRICS, uh, a G20, uh, basic on, on, on climate change, uh, and also the Shanghai Co Cooperation Organization. So I think uh, India is now engaging with all the countries. It is engaging with US, it is engaging with Russia, it is also engaging with China. I don't think this assessment is correct, but India has sided with US, and that's why China needs to use this kind of language or use it as an excuse to threaten India with war or any kind of other action. Well, you have this project uh, called the One Belt, One Road Initiative, uh, James Dutras, and uh, this is something that uh, India is not very well fond of, uh, which is uh, quite interesting in terms of the way that China uh, has wanted India to get involved. But there's been pushback by India. Do you think that uh, that is one of the reasons why we're seeing this conflict, aside from the history that is behind it? I, I, I don't rule out that I could be part of it, in the sense that maybe somehow that China is taking such a leading role in what we might call Eurasian integration. Certainly Russia, India's traditional friend, is very close with the Chinese right now and is a, is a, is a major participant in that project. So maybe India somewhere in its calculations is concerned about that. but. Whatever those concerns might be, I don't think that eliminates the need to try to defuse this crisis as soon as possible. If the, Chi if the Chinese are acting uh, provocatively, perhaps because they believe the Indians are playing the American card, so to speak, I, I think it's in New Delhi's interest to try to disabuse anyone of that notion 100 percent, as, as my colleague has done. Well, it, if this is true, well, first of all, what do you think? Uh, same question to you, Mr. Saxon. If you think that uh, this One Belt, One Road initiative, of which India has been vocal about pushing it back, not being very fond of it, 
perhaps has something to do behind the rising tensions and if there's any shape or form possible for the U.S. somehow to, and I know you said that you don't quite agree with that, but for the U.S. somehow to perhaps be egging India on this fact because we know that the U.S. is very much against this uh, project by China because of obviously the economic influence that this would yield for China and the entire world practically. Yeah, I think that there's a problem in one belt, one road initiative that part of it uh, passes through Kashmir, uh, passes through called CPEC, the Chinese China Pakistan Economic Corridor, and it passes through that part of Kashmir, which is uh, under illegal occupation of Pakistan. Uh, you know, in 1948, when India and Pakistan had a border dispute, and the, the, the Pakistani forces occupied a part of Kashmir, and it has been under that occupation uh, since then. And this corridor is coming from, from, from China and passing through Kashmir, going through Pakistan, going up to Gwadar port uh, on the Arabian Sea. And India has strongly objected to it, uh, that part of the initiative, calling it a violation of its sovereignty, which I think is a very, very legitimate concern of India. Uh, and I think this is, the, this, is the one, this is the main reason India is not uh, really willing to join One Belt, One Road initiative. As for the U.S. angle is concerned, I think U.S. would be very happy to use India against China, and China will be very happy uh, to see that situation because it both it gives both these countries leverage. But I think for India, it's a very different situation, very difficult situation. It becomes a pawn uh, in this game between China and U.S. Well, uh, the reactions, uh, James Dutras, is very interesting. You know, uh, I, I must correct myself because I see that there was actually a push by India telling China that we should work this out, that if you pull your troops back, that, uh, you know, we can uh, talk about this, but that is where China came in and said uh, this is being built on uh, their sovereign space, and uh, that's when the warning came out for India not to push their luck. Um, are we, are we seeing then that third country intervention to be prompted here, either the U.S. or maybe Russia? Do you see that to be coming up in the foreseeable future on this? I, I have not seen any direct reference to uh, U.S. Uh, incursion or insertion into this uh, discussion between China and in India. And frankly, I really don't think Washington is in a position to play that role, that our relationship with China uh, on strategic issues, uh, on North Korea, on this recent uh, challenge to a U.S. Uh, surveillance plane off the Chinese coast by, by Chinese fighters. I, I don't think Beijing would certainly trust us to play that role. They would see us leaning uh, in favor of New Delhi. And uh, I, again, I don't know if the Russians are in the position to do that either. One would think that these two countries are, are both mature enough and both um, uh, zealous enough in safeguarding their sovereignty and le legitimate interests to, to find a common language. I don't know if, uh, if, if there is a third country that can do this, but something that needs to be done to, to defuse this crisis. Well, that brings to the next question, uh, Mr. Saxon. What is next? Where do you see this going? At this point, we're not seeing, we're seeing a standoff. And of course, uh, the troop buildup uh, seems to be minimal, but uh, you never know. I mean, at this point, according to Indian officials, there's about 300 soldiers from either side that face each other about 150 meters apart at uh, this plateau by the name of Duklam. I think the, the good thing in this all dispute is that they, both the countries have not stopped talking to each other. That's a good sign. And I think next two, three days, Indian National Security Advisor is going to Beijing to take part in the meeting of National Security Advisors of BRICS countries. And then there he will talk to his, his Chinese counterpart and they will try to resolve the issue as soon as possible. Uh, uh, you know, again, looking back, to, I've seen this kind of situation emerging many times in the past, you know, it happened in the 80s, also a couple of times in the 90s, when Indians and Chinese troops came face to face and there was a very tense situation, but not a single bullet has been fired in the past, uh, in the past 50 years, since 1962 war. So that's a good sign, I think, uh, and as my colleague said, both the countries are big countries, responsible countries, mature countries, they're quite capable of resolving the issues peacefully through dialogue. And the Indian official is going to China. That's a good sign. He'll talk to his colleague, and they'll try to find a solution. Uh, it's, there's no easy solution. It's a very complicated issue because three countries are involved, and China has taken a very hard position on this. But I'm sure this this whole dispute can be resolved peacefully uh, without resorting to other means. Okay, Jim Dutra, same uh, question to you. What is next in the standoff? How do you think this is going to go? 
I, I hope it is going to go, I think it is going to go, as, as my colleague and I both hope it will go, that, uh, that dialogue and, uh, and given the stakes involved, uh, that dialogue really needs to be the solution here. And I hope that, uh, that b both in Beijing and New Delhi, they can, they can find some kind of a compromise that takes into account the other countries' legitimate concerns uh, and, and, and takes a step back from if, uh, a brink that, if it gets out of control, could be devastating. Um, I have uh, enough time to ask you each uh, one question. Uh, if uh, this uh, trip that's being made and uh, uh, resolve is not going to happen, Mr. Saxon, what then uh, options would there, would there be left? Because we're looking at a standoff at this area. Um, and it, it seems like, uh, based on the rhetoric, as we mentioned, it's heated up. Uh, what would be left for either country to do? Uh, China is very steadfast in terms of it not moving from its position. See, the, the India-China uh, India border, the Indo-Tibetan border, is almost 3,500 kilometers, and almost all of it is disputed. Uh, both the countries have been talking for the past 40 years, and they have not been able to resolve it. Uh, but the good thing is they have not fought a war uh, since 1962. So I think that it just adds to the existing dispute between the two countries. I don't think it's going to, uh, to, to boil over into a bigger problem or going to become a full-scale war between India and China. Uh, today, India and China uh, have very big trade, almost $100 billion of trade between India and China. China today is India's biggest trading partner. And China's economy benefits a lot uh, by trading with India. India and China, as I said before, are part of uh, are members of many multilateral organizations. They've been working together. And I think in the bigger scheme of things, this this issue of border dispute is not really important. But I'm not saying it's not a serious situation. It's a serious situation. And especially because the kind of language has been used by Beijing, uh, especially the English language newspapers like Global Times, uh, uh, which are published from, from China, uh, they've used a very, very strong, aggressive language against India. India, uh, uh, warning India, no in terms that this could lead to a war. It's a serious situation where it can be resolved. And I think both the countries will work differently to resolve the situation because a war between India and China is unthinkable. It's impossible. And it's something which no one really wants in this world. Okay, unfortunately, we're fresh out of time, but thank you. Let me thank former U.S. Senate Foreign Policy Analyst James Atras from Washington and Indian journalist and political commentator was speaking Shobhan Saxena from Sao Paulo. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the debate from Mikovit Tavoy and the entire team in the capital, Tehran. Goodbye.